Today I wanted to talk about something that isn't very controversial, so I'm talking about far-right politics, Israel, and the Middle East. Joy. Before I get into that though, I do want to thank everybody who watched my last video on Shadowversity because he definitely saw it. <laughs> And the thought of him raging about it right now is making me laugh, because out of nowhere, I'm suddenly blocked by him on Twitter, so <laughs> he saw it. Thank you, thank you so much, everybody, for helping spread that. It's got like 3,000 views right now, so if he saw it at that point, it's because, like I said, he's constantly name-searching himself. On to darker news, though. A lot of you have probably heard about the recent judicial reforms that have been going on in Israel, and the phrase judicial reforms is not inaccurate, but it also really softens the blow of what's been going on there, because the short version, and I'll preface this whole thing by saying I'm far from an expert in any of this, but this is my take on it, and it's not good. <laughs> like, none of this that's going on is good. If you want more details, then there are other people you can check out and listen to for that, but this is just gonna be an overview from my perspective. But basically, the reforms in Israel are going to make it so that the Supreme Court no longer has that much power. Like, it, it is no longer going to serve as a check on the power of the legislature. Like, they are going to do whatever they want now. There, there will no longer be any uh, indication, that, or excuse me, any guarantee that people are going to have fair criminal trials or civil trials, like lawsuits and stuff, there's no indication that's going to be fair. There's no indication that they're going to say anything is unconstitutional when the government tries to pass it. They are now just a puppet of whoever's in charge, which is unfortunately Benjamin Netanyahu. Israel was already not really a democracy, it was an apartheid ethnostate, but it was the closest thing to a democracy in the Middle East, and if you were an Israeli citizen, then you could be assured that you did have certain rights and that you did have a say in governance. Maybe not a large say, but you did have a say. And soon enough that's going to be gone. Because once governments like this start shutting other people out of power, like now they're shutting out the Supreme Court, soon enough they're going to be shutting out other people. Like, once that train gets rolling, you can't stop it very easily. And once people start getting shut out of power, business stops working very well. Like, you, you need an independent judiciary to have a proper functioning free market, which the investor class seems to know that because already a lot of money is fleeing Israel. Excuse me. Like, people are no longer investing in it. They're taking money they already have invested and trying to move it overseas as quickly as possible because now there's no real guarantee that the government won't come along, seize your assets, seize your property, seize whatever, and then you, you won't even get a fair shake in the court system, because in more democratic countries, they just can't get away with that sort of thing. Like, if you try that, then there has to be a whole long criminal proceedings, or there's somebody's going to sue them, and people can come out, and the courts, I should say, can come out and say, no, the government acted wrong there, give them their shit back. But that's not going to happen without an independent judiciary. So basically, democracy in Israel is starting to die, and business is going to follow. But I'm here to talk about the Israeli military, the IDF, as it's called, which... The Israeli Defense Force, I, I don't like that name. Like, whenever a military has a fancy name, that usually means it's compensating for something. Like, it, whenever it calls itself the People's Liberation Freedom Army of Against Oppression, or whatever the fuck, that means it's a shit military, and it does terrible things. And to put all this very bluntly and very shortly, dictatorships are bad at fighting wars, and Israel only exists as a modern nation-state because it's really good at fighting wars, because, like I said, it is the closest thing to a proper democracy in the entire Middle East. And now that that's going to go away, the IDF is going to start rotting from the inside. Like, the origins of the IDF, like, it makes sense why it would be the best military in that part of the world. And hell, nowadays the IDF is, uh, on a per capita basis, or I don't know if per capita is the right word, but uh, considering its size, the IDF might very well be the greatest military in the world. Like, obviously there's some that are bigger, and if, in a, just a straight-up fight would defeat them, yeah, but Israel's a small country. Like, when you just look at the sheer quality of it, it's, it's incredible. And that makes sense when you look at its origins, because it started, you know, right after World War II, when the nation of Israel was first founded. 
and a lot of the people who founded the IDF were people who had served during World War II in either the American Army, the Red Army, the British Army, or in one of the many partisan units that were in Eastern Europe during the war. So these guys had a lot of combat experience, and so in the first war where Israel asserted that, yes, it is going to exist, and it was fighting, you know, Palestine along with a bunch of other Arab countries, uh, they won very handily. They also committed just an outright genocide of the Palestinian people, let's be clear about that. Like, over the decades, the Israeli state has killed or displaced millions of people. Like, they, they committed a genocide, and that genocide is ongoing. Let's be clear about that. But being really good at fighting and doing horrible, nasty things are not mutually exclusive. You, you can do both. And the thing is, in the several wars that Israel has had with its neighbors over the years, they have largely been massively outnumbered in terms of manpower and equipment, but they have won handily pretty much every time. Like, they've fought off five or six countries at a time, and they've won. And they've fought off insurgencies, and they've... Maybe won isn't the right word, but they've rendered them mostly harmless. And there are a variety of reasons for that. But what it really boils down to is, like I said, democracies are better at fighting wars than dictatorships. Because democracies... Well, for starters, it's hard to quantify this, but pretty much every citizen in a democracy feels that they are benefiting from the state. You know, they feel they are somehow connected with the state. If the state does well, then they do well. That's not always true, but that's at least how people feel a lot of the time. Whereas in dictatorships, the average person doesn't care that much, because if the state does well, then that just means whoever's in charge and his inner circle are going to be doing well. And it is an unfortunate fact that pretty much all Middle Eastern countries are some flavor of authoritarian, and have been basically ever since they gained independence after World War II. Like, the, the ones that have monarchies, absolute monarchies, like Saudi Arabia, or ones that are constitutional, but the monarch still has a lot of power, like Jordan and Kuwait, or the ones where they overthrew the monarchy, but just replaced it with a totally different dictatorship, like Syria and Egypt and Iraq. Like, they're all, unfortunately, very authoritarian. And so, that means they suffer from things like corruption. Like, anyone who's been paying attention to the war in Ukraine over the past year and a half has probably heard that a lot of Russian soldiers' equipment is just not there, or it's low quality, because people are, like, selling it off, or they're taking money that's meant for equipment and keeping it for themselves. Like, that sort of corruption is everywhere in dictatorships. Like, it, it just is. Like, the idea that they punish corruption is just not true. It's propaganda. And incompetence being another big one, because to bl basically, when you're a dictatorship, it's more important that the people who are running the military and running anything really, uh, it's more important that they are loyal to whoever's in charge than that they are good at their job. So you wind up with like generals and colonels and such who just do not know what they're doing. And the military is also hamstrung in certain other ways. Like for example, when the US invaded Iraq in 2003, the soldiers that were fighting in the defense of Baghdad did not have radios to communicate with one another. Because Saddam Hussein didn't allow his soldiers to have radios for the most part because he was afraid that they would use them to coordinate a coup and overthrow him. Like, when you are a dictator, you have to hamstring your uh, subordinates in ways like that, otherwise they might come for you and you might no longer be in charge soon enough. And usually no longer being in charge means you're dead. There's an article that came out uh, back in 1999, so it's pretty out of date now and it wasn't great to begin with. Uh, it's called Why Arabs Lose Wars, and I I'm gonna link it down below because you should be able to check it out if you're curious. Uh, but it's an infamous article among people who study military science or military history because it takes a very real phenomenon that Arab militaries since World War II have been abysmal. Like, they, they just have. Like, all of them from, you know, Libya to Egypt to Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, up to Syria, like, they have pretty much all done horribly. Uh, however, most of those problems do disappear when you look at irregular forces, but I think that is a discussion for another time. But basically, they have all done abysmally, and this article takes that and draws a really strange conclusion from it. And basically it says that it's all due to Arab culture. Like, Arab culture does not allow a good modern military to be built or to function. And there's a lot of problems with that. Like, number one, th this article does point out some very real issues, and it 
like, yeah, like I was saying before, it points out that there's corruption and uh, that the armies are hamstrung in various ways to prevent them from overthrowing the leader and stuff like that. But, like I was saying, that's something that all dictatorships deal with. It's not exclusive to dictatorships in the Arab world. And on top of that, the whole thing, like I said, it blames it on Arab culture, and it basically says that everyone in that culture is ra raised to be sneaky liars and thieves. Like, it's, it's incredibly racist. It really is. Like, the whole thing has an attitude of, well, that's just what those people are like, which, in addition to being racist, is also just not helpful, because, like, it's just pointing out the problem and says, yeah, it's, that's just what things are like, but it doesn't offer any solutions at all. And Israel, throughout its history, has benefited from most of its opponents being incompetent. Like, it, it, or most of its military opponents, I should say, being incompetent. It just, it just has. Uh, like, the IDF is very good. I'm not saying it isn't, because it just, it just is. Only a fool would deny that. But it is even better when you compare it to all the people it's had to fight over the years. And... Like I was saying, once something becomes a dictatorship, institutions, like the military, start to rot away. Like, as Netanyahu and whoever is with him and whoever succeeds him comes to power, uh, we're not only going to see businesses fleeing the country and the economy is going to suffer, but the military money and equipment that's supposed to be where it's supposed to be is going to just disappear. It's going to dry up because you no longer have a functioning judiciary or law enforcement system to catch whoever's doing it and get rid of them. Like, the only people who are going to get gotten rid of for doing that sort of thing are going to be people that whoever's in charge, whoever the people in charge don't like. Excuse me, I didn't word that very well, but the, the people doing corruption are only going to get punished if they are not in the good graces of Dear Leader and his inner circle. People are only going to start getting promoted if they're in the good graces of Dear Inner Leader and his inner circle. Like, if they criticize them or they just can't be trusted or whatever, they're not going to get promoted. Like, they're not going to be in charge of things, so you're going to wind up with idiots in charge of stuff. And, like I was saying, with business and the economy drying up, uh, there's going to be less money to put into the military, meaning soldiers are going to get paid less and be less motivated. Uh, and, like I was saying, when it's a dictatorship, regular citizens feel like they are less connected to the state, so morale in the military suffers quite a bit as well. Uh, but they have less money for equipment and everything too, and that money gets siphoned off, so like the, the whole thing just starts to rot from the inside. Now, they can at least temporarily fix the problem of business and drying up and resources and money going away by just continuing to steal more from the Palestinian population, you know, st steal more of their houses, steal more of their land, just take all that that they can. And that for a while that'll work, but eventually that will dry up. Like, they can only expand so far. And a couple of decades ago, that would have been the death of Israel. Like, all of their neighbors wanted them wiped off the map. But nowadays, they have much friendlier relations with all, uh, not all their neighbors, but a lot of their neighbors. So they're probably not going to outright go to war with them at least anytime soon. And even the ones that they're less friendly with, let's say, are just not in any real position to threaten them. Like, a lot of countries in that area are just a complete mess right now, and hell, some of them might not even freaking exist in their current form in the next decade or two. Like, Syria is not going to be invading anyone anytime soon. Like, it's just not. that The whole country is a mess. Yemen, same story. E even if the Houthis somehow take over, come to power, and continue wanting death to Israel, they're not going to be able to do anything about it anytime soon. So what I'm getting at is, the IDF becoming shit will not immediately mean Israel dies, but that is something to just keep in mind. That, like, that, that's what I'm getting at here. That's the whole point of this. Like, Israel becoming a dictatorship means its military is going to fall apart. And any further discussion, I, I don't know. Like, th this sort of thing will take time, but it will happen. It, hell, we might not even notice until after it's already been a thing for a while. Like, again, with Russia, everyone assumed that it was one of the mightiest militaries in the world, and then it face-planted when it tried to invade Ukraine, which is a much, much smaller country. So, who knows? We'll, we'll see what happens, but that's about all. Goodbye.